Chameleon billboards, and speaking in two languages at once, this is Genesis Week. And welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we set up our studios at the abandoned Pyramid and Mining Outpost so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. God did not say, come. Let us be unreasonable together. But rather, we here at Genesis Week believe God gave you a brain for a reason. And we want to use our brains to find the truth along with you. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you will find us. While you're there, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and get extras like Creole rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. The original created world was designed as a peaceful one, with no death, free access to the tree of life, animals did not eat each other, and we did not eat the animals. As we read in Genesis 1.29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Animal and human death was non-existent. Yet sin came into the world through Adam and Eve, along with the first animal death, to cover the effects of their sin. But something else happened. As the world and life began to decline from the curse of sin, Even the animals became violent, to the point where God chose to destroy most of the animals as well in the worldwide flood. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. There was violence throughout the earth that was not part of the plan. The creation had become corrupted. And violence was a major manifestation of that corruption. Now, because this corrupt world is all that we have ever known, it is understandable that we would interpret the world around us in terms of violence. And you'll notice that this is one of the hallmarks of evolutionary theory, survival of the fittest. Charles Darwin's only degree was in theology. Now, just after her 10th birthday, Darwin's second daughter, Annie, died a heartbreaking death. Now, this seems to have marked a turning point in Darwin's life, which heightened Darwin's religious doubts. Now, it was at this point he really began to be more vocal about his evolutionary ideas, which he had pretty much kept quiet about, presumably due to his very devout wife, Emma. Evidently, Darwin tried to relate his daughter's death to this struggle for survival, the survival of the fittest and evolution. He tried to put death into the big picture of being the ultimate producer of life, instead of death being the enemy as it is labeled in the Bible. An enemy for which Christ died to rise again, showing himself victorious over this enemy. See, God does not like death either. Something in the environment radically changed at the time of the flood. It was at that point that God instructed Noah to eat meat as part of his diet. When we look through the fossil record, we see enormous plant and animal life. Plants like the club moss, which today grow maybe 16 inches or 40 centimeters tall, getting up to 35 meters or 120 feet tall, in the fossil record. Dragonflies, which today might get a wingspan of, oh, maybe that size, we find in the fossil record with wingspans of over three feet or one meter. 
Now you can imagine the mess that critter would make on your windshield at 120 kilometers an hour. Even animals like the camel were found to be some 19 feet tall in the fossil record. Sharks up to 100 feet or 30 meters long. We find the giant donkey in the fossil record as well, with a Latin name that is just screaming for a joke, Asinus giganteus. But that's not all. We also see the lifespans of humans drop off significantly at the time of the flood. Something radical happened at that time. The environment evidently became more hostile and less supportive of life. As a result, nutritional needs of the plants and animals became impoverished. The Lord even instructed Noah and his family at this point to begin adding meat to their diet, evidently in order to make up for the loss of nutrition in this new, more hostile world. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And so we need to be careful in how we interpret the observed world around us. Death, sickness, disease, predation. None of this was part of the original plan, the original creation before the fall. So why then would various animals be created with such sharp teeth? Carnivorous animals have sharp teeth. Well, just because they have sharp teeth and eat meat today does not necessarily imply that's what they were designed for. Fruit bats have equally sharp teeth. And our friendly carnivores that we're all so familiar with, dogs and cats, can be observed when they eat meat. You'll notice they do not use their long, sharp teeth to eat meat. They use their back molars. But there are other fascinating qualities that many animals have, like the chameleon. The chameleon, and many, many animals and fishes, can change colors, blend in with the background and hide. Now today, we simply interpret this capability as the ability to hide from predators. But if there was no predator when the critter was first designed, why then the ability to change color? Now, with this octopus as an example, it can change both the color and texture of its skin remarkably fast. How on earth does it do this? Well, let's take a look at chameleons, which have a multi-layered skin with the outer layer of skin being transparent. Now, below the transparent skin layer is a skin layer of cells called chromatophores, which contain yellow and red pigments. Below that layer is another layer of blue and white chromatophores. The third and deepest layer is made up of cells called melanophores, which contain a dark pigment. Uh, it's the same pigment that gives humans black skin. These cells then control how much light is absorbed or reflected. Now, all of these cells change size, retracting the pigmented cells, cells either by muscle contraction or chemical control like hormones. By changing the size of the cells, the animal controls how much of each color shows up. And, like mixing paint, the animal can mix the colors to make pretty much any color and also change how iridescent it is. Now, all of this smacks of incredible design. Not only do you have complex cells with specific colors, but complex layering so the different colors can be used to mix and match and make other colors. There are incredibly complex control systems. The animals can control their appearance. So why then did the designer whom I would say was Jesus Christ, our creator, design these animals with these incredible capabilities to hide from predators. Well, that appears to be what some of them use this ability for now, today in our fallen world. But is there more to the picture? More that would be missed because one was not looking because one was simply interpreting the abilities within the context of survival of the fittest. Arizona State University News carried the story entitled ASU Researchers Discover Chameleons Use Colorful Language to Communicate. As the researchers noted, the chameleons would change colors to convey information, almost like becoming a billboard. Or, like a mood ring, they would change colors to convey their mood. 
Now, one of the chameleons in the study had suffered a genetic mutation that no longer allowed it to change color according to its mood, and the researchers weren't too sure how the chameleon felt about that. It's okay, that last part was a joke. But it is true that they would convey their feelings by their expressions of color. As doctoral candidate Russell Lignan put it, by using bright color signals and drastically changing their physical appearance, the chameleon's bodies became almost like a billboard. The winner of a fight is often decided before they actually make physical contact. The winner is one that causes its opponent to retreat. While sometimes they do engage in physical combat, these contests are very short, 5 to 15 seconds. More often than not, their color displays end the contest before they even get started. And as you can see by the video from the research, the chameleons change color far faster than they actually move. So why then would the creator give these animals the ability to change colors? Well, why not? Because it's cool! <laughs> like we communicate with facial expressions, these animals can communicate by altering their coloration. Oh yes, they could also use this ability to camouflage and hide from predators, but just because they use it for that purpose does not mean that was its original purpose. We are in a fallen world. The incredible complexity of these color-changing abilities and control systems screams of an artistic creative creator. A University of Washington press release, along with a paper in Science Magazine, details a fascinating discovery of a second layer of information in our DNA. The title of the press release helps the layperson understand both the discovery and its significance. Scientists discover double meaning in genetic code. Now remember the genetic code is a language, a, a program essentially. It contains the instructions on how to build, operate, and maintain your body. Now a very small part of the DNA gives specific step-by-step -step instructions on how to build the parts that make up your body, proteins. As is still being discovered by scientists working on the ENCODE project, which we've mentioned repeatedly here on Genesis Week, a huge portion of the DNA has the job of controlling the rest of the DNA and how it's used. These controlling genes have been the focus of the ENCODE project and showing both how crucial and how extensive this huge portion of the DNA is. That huge portion, which was formerly called junk DNA. Now when proteins are made, the DNA is read three bases at a time. These groups of three are called codons. What the researchers discovered was that the codon could act as one of the instructions on how to build a protein, but also simultaneously, the codon would also act as one step in an instruction on how to control genes. Let me make an analogy. We have a complex computer system which reads instructions provided to the computer. The computer follows the instructions to control machinery, which makes metal parts for a robot, gears for example. The instructions are written in the common programming language known as machine code. Now envision that the computer also uses those exact same instructions, and instead the computer is told to read the instructions as FORTRAN programming code. The computer is able to read instructions on how to build the robot, using the parts it is making, with the instructions for both the manufacturing and assembly of the parts embedded in the same words. The person who wrote out those instructions would be beyond a super genius. Programming in two different computer languages at the same time. As David Klinghoffer put it on Evolution News and Views, genome uses two languages simultaneously. Try that yourself sometime, why don't you? Indeed, imagine a person speaking both Russian and English at the same time. Another analogy would be a book in which the same sentence could, sentences could be read either in English or in Portuguese. That would require astonishing intelligence. Only in this case, with our analogy of a robot building computer, the designer not only wrote the instructions the computer reads, but would also have had to design the computer to be able to read his two languages at the same time. 
from the same words. A language is useless if you do not have someone to say it and someone to understand it. But let us also remember a significant point, the potential failure of the system. Using two languages, you could stuff an incredible amount of information into an incredibly small package because you are using the same amount of words to effectively provide twice the amount of information. Imagine the hard drive space on your computer being doubled simply because the hard drive was able to write on top of the information that was already there without destroying or altering the original information. But now, if you get an error in the letters of the words, you now have a double whammy. Not only does it damage one set of instructions, it damages two sets of instructions. Now remember, evolution is not guided by intelligence. Non-intelligence does not give rise to intelligence, especially not astonishing intelligence, as is seen in the dual language system. Evolution is supposed to operate one small step at a time. In the case of genetics, changing perhaps one letter in the DNA. But as you can see, changing even one letter in the instructions would radically change not one, but two different readings of the words in two different languages. Now, my editors cringe at my writing. You can imagine trying to be an editor, editor who now has to proofread and correct a book written in two languages simultaneously. Now try doing that with a uh, <clears throat> very unintelligent editor. <laughs> now envision our robot building computer system and envision a scientist standing back admiring all of this precision of machinery that took staggering intelligence to design. That scientist then says, wow, that's amazing that natural processes made all of this computer system from dirt over many millions of years. The computer system even figured out how to write its own instructions and then figured out how to write and read two different languages using the same words. Isn't nature amazing? Well, besides being a thorough insult to the computer's creator, you already know what goes through your mind about that scientist. He is a fool for even contemplating such a suggestion. Now, I don't like to use this Bible verse, to be honest, but you can quickly see why King David, who did not know about this dual language in our DNA, nor its complex reading systems, said, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There is absolutely no way such a dual language system and its complex systems that read and use the languages could have evolved. In fact, it is easier for nature to assemble our hypothetical computer system that reads multiple languages and acts upon those languages than it is for the dual language to arise by natural processes in the human body. And I predict this will not be the last layer of code to be discovered in our DNA. This dual language system not only demands a designer, but a designer of astonishing intelligence that creator was none other than Jesus Christ, who created a body to live in as a human being here on earth. His astonishing intelligence was repeatedly seen by those who were trying to trip him up with their traps. Over and over again, we see that people were astonished by his responses, by his wisdom, by his knowledge. Our creator came in the form of a humble human being so that we could see he understood our sufferings. He took our sufferings upon himself as we, the human race, murdered him. He rose from the dead three days later to show he obviously knew something we didn't. He knew how to raise the dead. He was super intelligent. He knew how to bring dead cells back to life. I don't know about you. He's got my attention. He obviously knows something I don't. He rose from the dead so we could see that he was the way to eternal life, not just pointing the way, but leading the way. In order to follow him, he said you must be born again, a spiritual rebirth. Now being born again is simply acknowledging that you have sinned against God, done that which you knew was wrong. Now this world has been corrupted by sin, 
And the Bible tells us that God will destroy this world and make a new one. But of course, God cannot allow even one drop of sin into that new earth. Otherwise, it too will be corrupted. So none of us, not one of us, is able to enter that new earth and new heaven because we have all sinned. That is why Jesus died in your place and mine, paying the death penalty for our sins when he was the only human being ever to live on earth and not sin, and thus was the only human ever to live who could pay the penalty for someone else. Being born again is simple. Confess to Jesus that you've sinned. Turn from your sins and ask him to forgive you of your sins, giving your life wholly unto him, and living your life as if you were him, seeing as how he has now left earth to go make the new earth for you and for me. Stick around. We'll be back in a minute. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12 DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. Woohoo! Mail for me! If you recall last week, Ian from Ottawa wrote in in response to the previous week's show about the possibility of a chimp and a pig hybridizing to make the human race. Now, I had a couple of different people write in last week saying they thought I was a little harsh in my response to Ian, so I would like to take a moment to apologize, as I certainly meant no offense. It was not my intention to single out Ian either, as more than one person effectively said what Ian did. I just happened to pick Ian's email to use as a springboard to respond. So thanks to Ian for writing in, and I do apologize if I came across as harsh. That was not my intention. Russell wrote in, Hey Ian, love your videos, fellow Young Earth creationist here. I sent an email a week or so ago to one of my favorite YouTubers and I haven't gotten a message back. I'm assuming he thinks I'm an ignorant religious mental deficient. Anyway, I was wondering if you could touch on why exactly so many super smart people don't see the obvious gaping flaws with naturalistic evolution. Well, thanks for writing in, Russell. As I'm sure you're already aware, this is not an issue about science, though I tend to focus on science on this show because that's my passion and interest. Now, there are two issues here. One is just plain ignorance. Many, many people who have been taught evolutionary theory as fact just accepted it and never stopped to question it. I mean, why would they? It's a fact, right? <laughs> but then someone comes along and steps on their toes, prompting them to think and question. Now, that, of course, is the hope and goal of this show, to provoke people to think and ask questions. Now then there are those who have been shown the gaping flaws and yet still cling to naturalistic evolution religiously. This is now a spiritual issue. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world, of course, being Lucifer. Now I see the person's position almost immediately. When I present scientific evidence of a creator, there are those who just never thought about it, and they almost invariably perk up with, oh, interesting. <laughs> they just never heard anything like it before. In stark contrast, the reaction of those who do not want to believe is radically different. Spiritual blindness is the only answer I can give you. When I give solid science pointing to a creator, those who do not want to believe give responses that are downright irrational. Now, these are not stupid people, so 
why on earth would they give responses that are irrelevant and ludicrous? To the point where I will have non-Christians privately write to me, bewildered by the ludicrous responses given by those who do not want to believe. Even other non-believers see what's going on. And in fact, I've had many people tell me they wound up listening to what I had to say, not because of what I said, but because of the incredibly irrational and emotional responses against what I said. Many of those onlookers not only became Christians, but young earth creationists as well, even though some of them would have previously described themselves as atheists. Now, YouTuber Keith Truth posted a very interesting video a couple of weeks back that relates to this. A study in Sweden tested devout atheists. They asked the person to wish for bad things to happen and then had them ask God to do something bad. Their sweat levels increased when they asked God to do something bad. The researchers concluded that these people were basically in denial by stating that there was no God. Obviously, deep down, they believed there was a God. So to further complicate the answer to your question, it's human nature. Often what people say and what they believe are two different things. Marius, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, wrote in from Poland, do all examined trees buried in the flood all around the globe have that very little or almost no late wood like Axel Heiberg trees? I think that's important in considering the pre-flood climate and atmospheric conditions before the flood in global scale. Well, thanks for writing in. For those who may not remember, the late wood is the outer part of a tree ring, which is a tough outer layer the tree grows in preparation for winter. Now we looked at examples of preserved fossil wood from the Arctic and Antarctic, and they were missing this late wood, indicating the trees grew in tropical conditions. Now, as far as I'm aware, fossil trees found elsewhere do have late wood, but I'm not entirely sure. But because the reports were dealing with the Arctic and Antarctic, obviously the lack of late wood in the trees was noteworthy. Okay, I better call that a wrap, we're out of time. I'm your host, Andrew B. saying ta-ta for now, and thank you for watching Genesis Week. I hope you'll join me again for next week's Christmas special, Gifts from God. Remember, you can send us your questions, comments, and Christmas presents to us in a number of ways. Remember those words of warning our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, left us with, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjubi.org slash donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.